Hi, I'm Tamara Hi. Thomas, content editor for Urban Health Today, and I'm speaking with Dr. Sanisha Dubat, a physician scientist and pediatric oncologist at Penn State Children's Hospital and Penn State Cancer Institute. He's here to talk with us today about genetic mutations and their relationship to poor outcomes from B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, or B-A-L-L, in Hispanic and Latino children, and the novel therapeutic drug combination that may be the answer to this disparity. Thank you for speaking with me today. Let's get Thank started. You for me. Thank you for having me. Awesome. So can you walk me through your research? What first led you to try to answer the question of poor outcomes in BALL uh, for Hispanic and Latino children? And what did you first see in your work uh, with, the ch with diagnosed children that alerted you to a larger issue? Well, I was trained uh, at UCLA uh, for my uh, pediatric hematology oncology fellowship training. And uh, during my fellowship, and also as a young attending uh, physician at uh, UCLA, I took care of many children uh, with uh, B cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia uh, who were Hispanic uh, Latino background. And uh, myself and uh, other uh, physicians noticed that uh, very often they have. Uh, uh, worse prognosis and uh, a more aggressive form of B-cell uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So they required more extensive chemotherapy and again, worse prognosis. And then I start, uh, I was doing research at the same time, I'm a physician scientist, so I'm seeing patients doing uh, clinical work and bone marrow transplants, but also having my research team. So I started collaborating with Dr. Kimberly Payne at Loma Linda University, uh, who introduced me uh, to health disparity. And she was studying uh, how CRLF2 translocation, uh, which is another gene, occurs more frequently in Hispanic Latino children. Uh, since a large part of my research was focused uh, on a gene that encodes a tumor suppressor protein uh, for B cell acute lymphoblast leukemia in everybody, so called ICARS, uh, we started collaborating. Uh, and uh, I got more into this, and then I start noticing that uh, that uh, deletion of that tumor suppressor, which prevents leukemia, IKZF1, occurs, uh, is looks like it's occurring more in Hispanic Latino children. Uh, so one study came out about ten years ago, uh, which uh, studied the subset uh, only high risk uh, B cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and they confirmed. That CRLF2 is really more frequent in Hispanic Latino children. And they observed that very often they also have deletion of uh, ICARS. But they uh, very carefully stated uh, this is only a subset of B cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. We cannot say this decisively. And uh, this was more focused on CRLF2. So this time uh, we took unbiased approach, we just took all the children. Uh, of Hispanic Latino background and non-Hispanic Latino background uh, who were diagnosed at Los Angeles Children's Hospital uh, in Los Angeles. And uh, they were tested uh, for presence of uh, CRLF2 translocation uh, and uh, ICARS deletion. And what we found is that uh, CRLF2 uh, translocation, there are actually two types of translocation. One of them, is actually very much uh, increased in Hispanic Latino background, about three to four fold uh, increase. Uh, the other one is not. So the first one is health disparity. The new finding was that uh, Icarus deletion was uh, about two fold increased in Hispanic uh, Latino background children versus non Hispanic Latino background. And it's actually very frequent. Uh, CRLF2 translocation does not happen very often, but uh, Icarus deletion happens in about 29 to 30% of children 10 years and older of Hispanic Latino background versus 15% in a non-Hispanic Latino background. So that makes it the uh, largest uh, health, uh, most frequent health disparity in, uh, uh, in the children. Uh, cancer health disparity in children. Uh, another thing that we noticed is that the uh, presence of both mutation, CRF2 translocation and Icarus deletion occurs in about 11% of children of Hispanic uh, Latino background and we have not observed any such case 
in non-Hispanic children with two uh, mutations. So essentially what, uh, what we discovered there is that uh, there is something that predisposes, uh, that predisposes children of Hispanic Latino background to get Icarus deletion um, in higher frequency, twofold higher frequency than non-Hispanic population. And then apparently there is something when they get this deletion also predisposing for second mutation uh, for CROF2 uh, translocation. So uh, what is the practical significance of all this? First of all, uh, scientific advances is now, we know a little bit more what's causing leukemia to be more aggressive and requires more chemo uh, for uh, children of Hispanic Latino background. But also for practical purpose is, uh, uh, this is a huge alert for oncologists, pediatric oncologists, when they have a child with uh, his, uh, Hispanic Latino background origin. First of all, they have to do specific tests which would uh, look at the gray detail for presence of Icarus deletion, like as if one deletion, uh, and CLF2 translocation, because there is 11% uh, chance to have both and 30% uh, and chance to have at least one. And if you have uh, Icarus deletion, that by default automatically is called high risk leukemia and uh, would require stronger chemotherapy upfront. So not, uh, not every hospital is using very, uh, you need a special diagnostic methods for this molecular diagnostics to detect small deletions, uh, which are not trivial. And of course, uh, we need a new, new treatment which would preferentially target these particular uh, lesions. Hmm. So just to, to make sure I heard that correctly. So of the 239 children, uh, they were not all Hispanic and Latino children? No. They were not? No. Okay. No. What, what percentage of, of that group would you say were? Um, I would say about two thirds of them were, uh, or sixty percent of them were. I don't know the top of my head. Uh, I would say sixty percent of them were Latino, uh, uh, Hispanic background, and about uh, one third or forty percent maybe were, were known uh, Hispanic. It depends on a patient profile or Los Angeles Children's Hospital. And also, I would like to stress out when we uh, Hispanic Latino background in this uh, case means Hispanic slash late, uh, Latin uh, uh, Native Americans. Uh, so uh, you be not so much Puerto Rican uh, and Cuban, uh, Angeles area, California. So this is more present uh, in like uh, in Mexico, and this is very relevant for South America. Ah, okay. So it's mostly indigenous, not yes, African. yes, yes. Okay. All right. Uh, and you said they were age 10, 10 and above. So we uh, we divided them into two groups, uh, less than ten years of age and above ten years of age. The uh, the average age uh, was uh, pretty similar, uh, seven and five uh, age group. So there was not this significant. But when we looked uh, at age of ten and above, the uh, uh, the health disparity uh, was actually very very prominent. Less than ten years of age was much less prominent, I would say not non significant, but over 10 uh, was actually 10 and above uh, was actually uh, highly prominent. Uh, so yeah. Is this, um, is this a hereditary uh, gene mutation? Or is this a de novo? Is this something that this is de novo? Okay. This is de novo associated with leukemia. Uh, I'm not aware of hereditary mutation of a serial of two. And uh, IKZF1 Icarus mutation does occur, hereditary is extremely rare. And actually our team uh, uh, discovered that uh, several years ago. Uh, and it is, uh, it is very rare, fortunately, and it is uh, typically associated with uh, immune disorders, uh, with uh, immune deficiency, depends where mutation takes place. And so far it was described, I would say at least 20 cases uh, and a couple of families that uh, occurs. Uh, and uh, it is also known that predisposes you, uh, regardless of your background, I think background predisposes you for leukemia. Uh, but it's uh, fortunately, it's very rare thing. Uh, it's very rare. So actually, yes, we did discover uh, officially new disease. We call it uh, Icarus deficiency uh, syndrome, uh, which is, again, fortunately rare. 
So what exactly are these genes? They're, they're central to your findings and to your proposed treatment. What exactly, um, you say Icarus deletion uh, or, or the gene is IKZF1, and then the, the CFR2, the precursor to that is CRFL2 gene. What yeah. are those genes? Can you so, uh, okay, so Icarus uh, is, a, uh, is a gene which encodes for protein. That protein binds DNA and regulates the activity expression of many other genes. So Icarus can affect the function of uh, lots of genes. We are talking about hundreds and uh, thousands of different genes. Uh, in addition to this, uh, Icarus uh, associates makes complex with many other proteins, among them uh, so-called chromatin remodeling uh, proteins, uh, which are very much involved in uh, a three-dimensional structure of chromatin, the proteins that shape up uh, the uh, overall regulation of gene activity and overall genome. So Icarus is very much involved in uh, epigenetic uh, control of uh, gene activity. Uh, on the other side, CRLF2, uh, which stands for cytokine receptor-like factor 2, um, uh, it, it actually is in the receptor in a cell membrane and uh, makes it forms a signaling complex with uh, two other proteins, uh, TSLP and the IL-7 receptor alpha. And uh, it, uh, it stimulates, together with them, stimulates uh, multiplication uh, of cells uh, on the ex uh, external signal. Uh, so it gets a uh, translocation of CRF2, makes it overexpressed, makes it produced more. Uh, and so it multiplies the, uh, the signal for cells to, uh, to multiply. Uh, so um, both, pro both genes are essential for normal uh, uh, hematopoiesis, for normal production of, of, of uh, blood cells. So this is a typical example of the normal genes uh, who either mutated or got translocated. Uh, and uh, in one case, CRF2 goes high too much. In the other case, Icarus uh, goes down because one copy is missing. Uh, and uh, so you have uh, absence of suppression uh, for cell multiplication in case of Icarus and uh, additional extra signal. Yes, keep multiplying, keep multiplying and, and you get leukemia. And so with, a, with, with the, this Icarus and the CRF2 not uh, working properly, so that would rule out stem cell treatment for such patients, right? Uh, it would, uh, stem cell, yes, it would rule out, uh, well, stem cell treatment is uh, bone marrow transplant essentially is designed uh, to uh, give you super high dose of chemotherapy, uh, sometimes uh, together with the radi uh, radiation. Uh, and uh, the only reason why patient survives is that you actually infuse another bone marrow. Uh, somebody else's uh, stem cells. So per se, you're really not uh, killing stem cells. You're just wiping out everything, including hopefully all leukemia cells uh, or other malignant cells. Uh, so a pure stem cell treatment, uh, no, would not uh, would not uh, work in this case. Bone marrow transplant uh, could be a choice, but bone marrow transplant is a tough procedure which is associated with a uh, high morbidity, uh, with uh, very strong side effects, and uh, it's, uh, it's typically the last resort uh, that you're trying uh, the patient. Uh, this is uh, certainly the most powerful one, but because of side effects, uh, you try to do regular chemotherapy uh, before that. And, and fortunately, most of the B-cell ALL we can actually cure without. Oh, okay. Well, then let, let's talk about your treatment strategy then. Can we talk okay. about that? Sure, sure. And actually, uh, I can send you slides. Uh, I actually prepare one slide for you. And uh, uh, so uh, yeah, I can share it later with you. So essentially, um, this is uh, what I call improved uh, procedure medicine, a dual strategy. Typical procedure medicine uh, goes after one protein, which is essential uh, for cellular proliferation. In this case, it's mTOR, uh, which is a protein which acts a distal signaling from CRLF2. Uh, so mTOR uh, needs to be uh, active and uh, stronger activity, more cell will proliferate. It has been known for a long time. And there are many drugs which affect mTOR. One of them is rapamycin. 
so, uh, what is the biggest problem for precision medicine? Let's say a typical example of precision medicine is Gleevec, which goes, uh, which uh, works against BCR able translocated uh, uh, leukemia, uh, which was discovered a while ago, and uh, it really was uh, uh, kind of like flagship of precision medicine. So, how does leukemia and other malignancies escape that? Well, actually, two ways. One way is simply uh, this protein can be more produced. Uh, and then you just need more and more drug and uh, you get uh, off-target effects, uh, toxicity in the pulse. Even more frequently, what happens is that the gene that produces the protein mutates. And then protein actually changes. It's still functional, but changes. And suddenly, drug does not bind that protein very well and simply doesn't work anymore. So, uh, since we discovered that ICARS uh suppresses which means down regulates many of these tumor proteins including mTOR we have uh, published in the past that uh, that icarus as a tumor suppressor uh even if you have enough icarus in leukemia icarus gets inactivated by another enzyme so called ck2 kinase so icarus when it is in cells if you have leukemia does not function properly so when you target and inhibit that kinase, you relieve, uh, you release ichors, you really make it much stronger, and it can perform function and fight leukemia much better. Mm -hmm. So if fighting leukemia, and so ichors has many functions, and one of them, what we discovered, is to downregulate to suppress mTOR. So now we said, okay, we're going to target mTOR directly on a protein level. Is rapamycin, and we are also going to re uh, restore Icarus function by targeting the other kinase CK2, and that way Icarus will prevent more mTOR from being produced, and also we are going to attack uh, mTOR as a protein. So we are attacking production of the protein and protein itself. Uh, so it's a dual targeted treatment, precision medicine. And this was the first time that uh, was really tried in a preclinical uh, way, that leads to our knowledge, uh, and uh, it worked very nicely. And the another uh, interesting thing which we did in our research is uh, we used uh, patient-derived xenografts. So patient-derived xenografts uh, use uh, uses the cells, malignant cells, in this case leukemia, uh, from patients, from human patients, and we are injecting into mice which have no immune system. So normal, uh, if uh, any animal has normal immune system, we would reject cells of different species in the moment, in a, within seconds. But these mice actually cannot do that because they have no immune system. Uh, so that way you can treat human tumor, in this case, uh, leukemia, in a living animal, which has a liver, spleen, gut, heart, kidneys, uh, everything, and you can test this. And particularly uh, in this case, since we are targeting health disparity, we were able to obtain uh, leukemia cells from uh, from children of Hispanic Latino background. So, uh, so we actually used uh, PDXs from uh, children of uh, Hispanic Latino background to study this. Wow! Wow! Well, do, do you foresee any short or long term effects from this treatment strategy? I mean, it sounds you know outstanding, but well, thank you. Uh, we don't at this moment. Uh, obviously, you never know until you try in human. But so far, uh, CK2 inhibitor has been tested for other tumors in phase one trials. And uh, so far, we did not hear much uh, side effects. We certainly did not see any side effect in mice. Uh, and rapamycin is, uh, rapamycin so far has not been uh, associated with, uh, with uh, any strong side effects. Uh, in fact, some people even uh, say that uh, because it's anti-inflammatory that should be used more frequently, but I'm not going there. Uh, th that's, that's another problem. study. Uh, that's uh, that's another uh, story <laughs> and not, not proven. Uh, so, so far, we, uh, we do not anticipate much that will happen. Okay, and uh, if it, you know, if and when it gets approved, do you, um, do you think it will be affordable to all Hispanic and Latino 
patient? I think so. I, I seriously hear, uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, rapamycin is not very expensive medication. And uh, CK2, there is one company that produces right now. And uh, to be honest, I have no idea uh, how much uh, would the drug cost. Uh, but typically, uh, then start competition and uh, uh, other companies will start producing similar type of drug. Uh, so uh, I'm certainly hoping that it would not be expensive. Certainly, I, I have no control over that. No, uh, no, I, but, I yeah. I but, but so far, so far, I would say uh, on top of my head, uh, at least rapamycin should not be expensive. Uh, okay. and, uh, and the other one, I hope it, it should not be. Because oftentimes disparity, you know, in medicine does include, you know, uh, limited access to uh, life-saving treatments. So that that's why I just, you know, asked that. Yes, uh, yes. You do that's true. That's true. No, you're completely correct, and uh, that's something that uh, we are working on a, on a different level, certainly. Uh, and both American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Society of Pediatric Hematology and Oncology is fighting that kids should have uh, access to all the drugs available. And there are many foundations uh, uh, at Penn State. There is a Four Diamond uh, Foundation uh, that uh, that uh, supports uh, all the expenses and covers all the expenses. Uh, that parents have uh, for any malignant uh, disorder, uh, and uh, obviously St. Jude has uh, their own, uh, but there are other uh, foundations uh, besides uh, so uh, who are supporting, and uh, and as a, we as a society certainly uh, will and should do a better job uh, doing this. Uh, but this is uh, so that's certainly uh, that area uh, we should tackle, and uh, yeah, I recognize that. Uh, but certainly uh, we should also fight. Uh, when we see a uh, biological reason for that, uh, we should tackle that uh, specifically uh, as well, because uh, that's also important. Uh, this is a, a too difficult disease. Uh, we cannot afford to lose any front. <laughs> well, you know, if children are dying, you know, and, and responding poorly to the usual treatment, you know, I would, I, yes. I would think that would, you know, oh, yes. impetus yes. to, you know. Yes, no, you're correct. And, uh, no, I, you know, I don't want to put you on the spot. I'm just, you no, know. No, 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 no. I appreciate. It. No, no, you're right. You should. Uh, and uh, so, uh, and the good thing is, at least in pediatric oncology, we are seeing lots of successes. And uh, nowadays, uh, I would say about eighty percent uh, of all children who who get cancer uh, overall uh, would survive. And uh, so we want them, uh, you know. And yes, uh, you would call it success, and I'm calling it success. But uh, in the same time, I like to say this means 20% too much. Uh, so, <laughs> so, yes, and I'm still kicking that way. So what I really want is a cure. Uh, and it's fine. Uh, we're ambitious and, uh, and we, we have to be ambitious about this. And also we want cure with chemotherapy, which uh, would not uh, make it so toxic that uh, I want them to have productive life. Because these children, I want them to live another 70, 80 years, and maybe more. Uh, uh, we'll see. Uh, and uh, I wanted to live a productive life and uh, not to go, not to visit hostels too often. They, they already had their share in the early, <laughs> early youth. Do you think there's any value to testing uh, children early for these uh, genetic variations of Hispanic and Latino children? No. Uh, no, because it's such a, such a rare thing. Uh, okay. No, so it's not really cost effective uh, to do that. Uh, simply, it's more uh, when we have suspicion for leukemia in Hispanic Latino uh, children, we should uh, we should test for both uh, CLF2 and and uh, IKZF1 across. But in your experience, by the time they're diagnosed, how far along are they? Are they advanced in the disease, or are you? Fun catching it early. Uh, you know, in leukemia, it's a little bit less important than in soil tumor because it's in the blood. It's already everywhere. Uh, wow. So, so earlier the better because less toxicity and less complications from treatment. Uh, so, and unfortunately, leukemia sneaks really uh, with the very mild symptoms. You are a little bit tired. You're a little bit anemic. Uh, you get bruises. Uh, and you know uh, what normal kids does not run and, uh, and right. play the sport. <laughs> so it's not easy to diagnose. Uh, you typically diagnose uh, after God knows how many weeks. Uh, so uh, yeah, and I would not worry about that. Uh, but it's uh, it's important to detect immediately uh, when suspicion uh, arouses and that, uh, to detect. Uh, uh, if it's high risk, so we can start upfront because upfront treatment is extremely important. 
uh, and uh, and it's good to know with uh, to start immediately with the uh, most appropriate drugs uh, the strongest or the most targeted in this case well, so have you been approved yet uh, to to um, to continue your research on on your treatment on patients yet um, we would like to. We would like to. Uh, no, we just published this. So now the next step is actually to go through uh, institutional review board and uh, to test uh, uh, to test this uh, treatment on uh, on uh, both uh, children and adults because uh, the same health disparity was observed in adults and uh, studied by MD Anderson a couple of years ago and again on high risk leukemia only uh, also detected similar stuff on the CRLF2 uh, uh, in in adults. Uh, but again, also a subset of leukemia. It was essentially a similar study to, to one uh, done 10 years ago, just in adults. Uh, so I'm pretty sure. Uh, and again, Icarus uh, deletion itself uh, does occur uh, in uh, both populations. Uh, some of the uh, more frequent, some uh, less frequent. So restoring Icarus function uh, is... Uh, is relevant to probably anybody who has uh, B cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Uh, so uh, we would like to do uh, both the children and adults. Uh, yes, sooner the better. I would like to, and uh, yes, we are uh, making uh, uh, we are making all the efforts. Uh, another thing, which uh, also is, uh, we need to make sure we have enough medication. Uh, CKT inhibitor, is, as I told, is really new drug produced only by one company, and. Uh, Honestly, I don't know what their capacity is <laughs> to produce the drug. So short of this, so, okay. So you diagnose, you find, uh, you know, uh, th these, these variants, then what's the treatment now? What is the current treatment? Oh, current treatment, uh, there are several protocols which developed uh, over the last uh, 50 years, and I can tell you successes and, uh, and yeah. less success. Mm -hmm. uh, right. There, uh, if it's so-called standard risk leukemia, there will be typical uh, three drug, uh, so-called three drug uh, treatment. Mm -hmm. If it's a high risk uh, leukemia, which if you have Icarus deletion, mm -hmm. uh, almost by, by default becomes high risk leukemia, regardless of age and regardless of presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, nowadays we are doing more molecular typing and there is gene expression profiling. Uh, you might have heard so-called pH-like leukemia, which is high risk, which has certain expression profiling, which is consistent with the pH to leukemia so there are established protocols and these protocols are working quite well and uh, about 80 uh, percent of children with b-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia would go into remission which means uh, leukemia would disappear and they would stay in remission about 20 percent of them however leukemia would come back and would relapse and as much as uh, B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, right now, overall survival of this type of leukemia, which is the most frequent leukemia and most, one of the most frequent malignancy uh, in children, about 90% of them would survive. But that means 80% would go in remission and stay in remission and be cured. Only 20% who uh, relapsed with leukemia comeback, only 50% of them would survive. And uh, deletion of Icarus mm -hmm. uh, gene uh, increases the chance of relapse of leukemia coming back at least three, fourfold, and according to some studies, even up to tenfold. Uh, so it really, really uh, increases your chance uh, for relapse. So, and that number, as much as we can say that the 90% is tremendous uh, success of medicine, tremendous. Uh, on the same time, uh, over the last 40 years, the survival of a relapsed leukemia when we came back did not change. It stayed 50%. Uh, so we got better and better treating, uh, I wouldn't call it easy, there is no easy leukemia, but uh, uh, we are getting better and better treating standard risk leukemia, but that uh, super high risk leukemia, which uh, comes back, uh, it's still a challenge. And uh, where the, these are directly related to Icarus deletion. And uh, that approach that we are restoring Icarus function, uh, so essentially dragging undraggable because mm -hmm. Icarus suppressed leukemia, so it's considered to be undraggable. This is actually a new paradigm that we suggested a couple of years ago, first time. And now we really proved that it works uh, not just as a single drug, but in combination, which is important. Uh, any malignancy is, uh, 
too complex disease to be treated and cured by only one medication. And even if we see from time to time, we read, uh, oh, this medication is miraculous. You need a really combination, but that combination has to be designed rationally, uh, targeted, so if we know why we're mixing uh, certain uh, drugs and both because of toxicity, but also to target specifically, in this case, mTOR or could be something else. Dr. Dovat, do you think CRISPR gene editing could ever become a tool for pediatric oncologists? Oh yes, it will, it will, it will. It will take some time, uh, but it will. Already we are seeing in hematology, uh, we are seeing uh, first clinical trials and uh, we are doing a wonderful job there. And uh, like every technology, it's gonna be refined. Uh, right now, still early stage, but uh, but it's tremendous progress happening over the last uh, several years. And we are following, we are doing in our research, uh, CRISPR, and we are collaborating with people who are doing you know, more CRISPR, way more CRISPR than we are doing. Uh, so it will be. This is uh, this is amazing tool. Uh, and uh, again, uh, first the biggest step, just discovering this tool and discovering this is possible to edit genes, which was. Amazing, uh, unbelievable, uh, 10 years ago or even less. Uh, but now that we can edit genes, now we have to refine. Uh, simply like any weapon uh, in, in, against the cancer. Now we have to refine that weapon, make it uh, more precise, uh, much stronger, much uh, much finer, and it will work. So yes, I believe. Uh, I'm believing in CRISPR. One last question for you, Dr. Dovat. You said that further research is needed to understand the biological mechanisms for why um, the, these gene mutations happen to uh, Hispanic and Latino children. Do you plan to further that research to spearhead yes, that? Yes, yes. We are already studying some, uh, some stuff that we want to do more because uh, two questions are uh, now based on what we, uh, what we have uh, seen here is that uh, we have the model that uh, most likely uh, Icarus deletion occurs first, and then uh, is followed by CRAF2 translocation. So two questions which uh, answer lies in the uh, genome, uh, because the genome is huge, and uh, there are still lots of uh, lots of things in genome that we don't know. Uh, and uh, so first question is why Icarus deletion happens twice as much in the Hispanic Latino. Uh, children and when you have leukemia versus uh, non-Hispanic Latino children. And second, why when you see equals deletion, why only in one kid's uh, CRAF2 translocation would happen, but not in the others? Uh, so uh, yes, that, that's, the, that's the question we need to answer. And uh, the, because that would help us first uh, understand leukemia and second, uh, that's gonna give us more targets. Uh, uh, so we can uh, again go for, I believe in precision medicine, I believe in uh, targeted treatment because uh, first of all, it's uh, more efficient and uh, it's less toxic. Dr. Sunisha Tovat, this is very exciting news. This is very educational and uh, I can't thank you enough. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, for, for your time, for interviewing me, because I think it's uh, very important to, to, to convey the message uh, to, uh, to society, uh, because uh, uh, nowadays when, when uh, scientific wor words does not always uh, reach the society, uh, it's important. So, so what you're doing, uh, I really, really appreciate that. Uh, uh, the way I view things is uh, we are all uh, on the same, uh, on the same uh, quest uh, to conquer cancer. Yeah to cure kids and everybody has its uh, role and each role is equally important, I would say. And uh, so uh, I thank you very much for doing this. Well, thank you. I thank you more. <laughs> we need more people in medicine like you. Thank you, thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs>